Hello, the objective of this lecture is to introduce combinations of loads and how they are handled in the design of civil and architectural engineering structures. Now that we have discussed the different types of loads that typical buildings are subjected to, and now that we have a basic understanding of the different philosophies of structural design, most importantly, the load and resistance factor design philosophy, we can discuss the development of load combinations. Every structure that we design has to be designed for several combinations of concurrent loads. It wouldn't be practical to design a building for just dead load, or a bridge for just live load, or another structure for just wind loads. We have to design for the possibility that each of these loads may occur in combination with each other. The trick is to figure out which combinations of loads that we need to consider. One obvious solution is to simply design for all of the loads acting at their maximum lifetime level at the same time. While this would likely provide a high level of safety, it would also likely result in a structure that is too expensive to build. And is it really practical to design a building for an earthquake load during a 50-year wind event while it is snowing? That's where load combinations come into play. The first step is to categorize our loads as permanent loads, loads that are either variable or transient, loads that are environmental or meteorological, and, at least for my purposes, loads that are from a geologic source like earthquake loads. The idea is that for load, res load and resistance factor design philosophy, we have the governing equation that is the sum of gamma times Q has to be less than or equal to phi times R sub N. Right now we're going to focus on the development of the left hand side of this equation. We're focusing on the sum of gamma times Q, which are the load combinations that we design for. Load factors that we use are typically going to be either greater than one or less than one. If a load effect used in the design of a member or a component increases the demand on that member or component, then the factor on that load effect is typically greater than one. Whereas if the load effect reduces or mitigates the demand on the component, then the factor on that load is typically less than one. Earthquake and wind loads are treated a little bit differently than other loads since they are calculated at their maximum lifetime levels, whereas most of the other load effects, dead load, live load, rain load, etc., are calculated at their arbitrary point in time levels. So when E and W are included in our load combinations, they are often factored by a load factor of one. Different references use different terminology, but a lot of times you'll see the term strength level loads used for earthquake and wind loads that are calculated at their maximum lifetime level. One change that was implemented in the 2022 edition of ASCE 7 is that snow loads are now calculated at their strength level. As a result, load factors on snow loads, S, have changed in the 2022 edition. It's also worth mentioning that if you look back through the last several versions of the ASCE 7 standard, you will see that wind loads used to be calculated differently. And until 2010, they were factored by a factor of 1.6. The load factors in these combinations were developed using a first order probability analysis based on a 50 year recurrence interval and they're calculated using a broad survey of reliabilities that were inherent in contemporary designs at the time of their development. That means that the developers looked at buildings that were currently in service at the time and calibrated the load factors so that they would get approximately the same level of reliability out of newer structures that were inherent in existing structures. These combinations are intended for the design of any structural member regardless of material, and they're intended to be used with resistance factors that are given in material specific design specifications. The idea is that you can use the same set of factored loads for a building regardless of the material that it being used. And if the building is being made out of concrete, then you use resistance factors that are found in the ACI specification, or if the building is made out of steel, you use resistance factors found in the AISC specification. This wasn't always the case. In the early days of the load and resistance factor design philosophy, there was one set of load combinations that were used in the design of steel structures, and there was a second set of combinations that were used in the design of concrete structures. This was a real headache when you had buildings that were made up of both steel and concrete, so it's a good thing that this issue has been resolved, and now we have one set of load combinations that, in theory, should apply to all of the different elements in a given building, regardless of whether they're made out of steel, concrete, or wood. 
Finally, the combinations that we're going to discuss, at least initially, are not intended for serviceability criteria. There is one set of load combinations intended for strength checks and a second set of load combinations in, that are intended for serviceability checks. Load combinations in general are constructed using one of two approaches. They're constructed either by starting with a dead load and then adding one or more of the transient loads at their maximum lifetime level, along with the environmental loads at their arbitrary point in time levels, or they're constructed by starting with a dead load and adding one or more of the environmental loads at their maximum lifetime levels, along with the transient loads at their arbitrary point in time levels. The idea here is that dead load is a permanent load, so it's always going to be there. You also have live load, which is a transient load, and let's consider snow as the environmental load. It would be rational to design for a rather large live load along with an average snowfall, or it would be rational to design for a rather large snow load with an average live load. But it wouldn't be as rational to design for a live load at its maximum lifetime level along with a snow load at its maximum lifetime level. In other words, if there was a 50-year snow event, odds are that most of the people that would normally occupy a structure would probably stay home. Taking this even further, the odds of a structure being hit by a hurricane and an earthquake at the same time are quite small, so we typically don't design for loads that include both W and E in the same combination. There are seven basic load combinations in the ASCE 7 standard. The first combination, taken as 1.4 times the dead load, is included to address long span structures or structures that have a high dead load to live load ratio. In load combination number two, live load is the primary load and the dead load and roof loads are companion loads. Since live loads are calculated at their arbitrary point in time levels, they are multiplied by a factor of 1.6 in this load combination to approximate their maximum lifetime level. Then the dead loads and environmental roof loads, L sub R, S, or R, at their arbitrary point in time levels are added in. In load combination number three, the roof load is the primary load and the dead load and live loads are the companion loads. Thus, the environmental roof loads acting at their maximum lifetime levels are considered to act concurrently with the dead and the live loads at their arbitrary point in time levels. Load combination number three also includes a permutation that treats wind as a companion load when the roof load is treated as a primary load. Next, we have load combinations four and five that address wind as the primary load, and load combinations six and seven that address earthquake loads as the primary loads. When it comes to wind loads and seismic loads, it's important to remember that they have directionality associated with them. That means that when these loads act horizontally, they can act in either the positive or the negative direction. In other words, these loads can act either left to right or right to left. In fact, if we consider a three-dimensional structure, it's actually more complicated than that. You can have loads that act from east to west, from west to, uh, from west to east, from north to south, or from no south to north, or in multiple directions at the same time. These lateral loads tend to cause either compression or tension in some of the columns within a building, and additionally, depending on the nature of the wind and the way that it affects the structure, wind can result in a downforce or an uplift on the roof as well. As a result of this, we have load combination number four for the case where wind effects are additive to the dead load effects in a member or component, and we have load combination number five where the wind effects and the dead load effects act in opposite senses. In the former case, the dead loads are factored by a value of 1.2 where they are additive to the wind loads, and in the latter case, the dead loads are factored by a value of 0.9 where they act in the opposite sense as the wind loads. The same idea is true for seismic loads as well, except that in load combinations 6 and 7, the seismic loads are broken down explicitly into their horizontal effects E sub H and their vertical effects E sub V. If we look at some of the details associated with these seven load combinations, we'll find in the exceptions included in the ASCE 7 standard that the load factor on L in combinations 3, 4, and 6 is permitted to be taken as 0.5 for all occupancies in which L0 is less than or equal to 100 pounds per square foot. We haven't discussed the live loads in much detail yet, but L0 is the unreduced live load and the live load levels that we design for are often in the range of 40 to 70 pounds per square foot, occasionally up to 100 pounds per square foot. 
It's only in rare cases that the design live load is higher than 100 pounds per square foot, so in most of the cases we can design for 0.5 times L in our load combinations. To reinforce the general approach used here, in each of the load combinations we consider a permanent load, a primary load acting at its maximum lifetime level, and companion loads acting at their arbitrary point in time levels. In load combination number one, the dead load is the primary load. In load combination number two, live load is the primary load. In load combination number three, the roof loads are the primary load. In load combinations four and five, wind load is the primary load. And in load combinations number six and seven, the earthquake loads are the primary loads. Remember that dead loads, live loads, roof loads, and rain loads are calculated at their arbitrary point in time levels, while snow loads, wind loads, and earthquake loads are calculated at their maximum lifetime levels. Thus, 1.6 times L represents the live load acting at its maximum lifetime level, but 1.0 times S represents the snow load acting at its maximum lifetime level. Note that the factors of 0.5 or 0.3 in the case of snow loads are used on the companion loads. This is because the ASCE standard recognizes that the nominal values of the loads tend to be biased in excess of their true arbitrary point in time values. I should also mention that the wind loads in combinations four and five are formally written as W or WT, indicating that either the conventional wind load W or the wind load associated with a tornado W sub T should be considered. To keep things simpler at this point, however, I'm going to use just the variable W to represent wind loads. And when we discuss the details associated with wind loads, I'll be more explicit with the nomenclature. We also have to consider the possibility that in some cases, it can be more critical if one or more of the transient loads or environmental loads aren't acting on the structure. Let's take this two span beam, for example. We have a uniformly distributed dead load, and that's going to lead to the case where we have positive moment near the middle of each of the spans and negative moment over the center support. Now suppose that we're designing for a live load that consists of two point loads acting in each of the two spans. If we have all four of those point loads acting on the beam, it would result in a maximum negative moment over the center support, but that isn't the most critical case when you consider positive moment. If you were to design for just the two live loads acting in the first span, that would lead to a larger positive moment in the first span than all four live loads acting together. Additionally, considering only the two live loads in the first span might result in a negative moment in the second span. Similarly, if you were to design for just the two loads in the second span, that would actually lead to a larger positive moment in the second span than all four live loads acting together, and you might result in a negative moment in the first span as well. So the takeaway here is that you have to consider different permutations of transient and environmental loads acting on the structure. Sometimes the case of some or all of the transient loads not acting is actually the critical case. There are several other permutations to these load combinations that also need to be considered. For example, in load combinations four, five, six, and seven, we have the plus or minus signs that indicate the directionality associated with the wind loads and the horizontal earthquake loads. In load combination number three, you see that we have 0.5L or 0.5W. And finally, in load combinations two, three, and four, we need to consider either the roof live load or the snow load, or the rain load. One way of simplifying this a bit is if we consider the roof loading as a single variable, defining 0.5 L sub R, or 0.3 S, or 0.5 R as the arbitrary point in time roof loading, R sub APT, and defining 1.6 L sub R, or 1.0 times S, or 1.6 times R, as a maximum lifetime level roof loading, R sub MLL. When we make that modification, the load combinations look like this, where we use R in place of the roof loads in load combinations two, three, and four, using R sub APT to represent the roof loading at its arbitrary point in time level, and using R sub MLL to represent the roof loading at its maximum lifetime level. This can be a bit confusing at first since we're using R to denote the rain load in some cases, and then we're using R to denote the roof loading in other cases, 
but after you work through a few problems, the utility of this approach should become apparent. Now let's consider the possibility that some of the transient and environmental loads may not be acting on the structure at any given time. This really doesn't affect the first combination since the first combination includes only the permanent dead load that's always present on the structure. When we consider all of the possible permutations of the second load combination, however, we first consider the possibility that both the live load and the roof load act at the same time as the dead load. Then we consider the possibility that only the live load acts at the same time as the dead load. Then we consider the possibility that only the roof load acts at the same time as the dead load. And finally, we consider the trivial case where neither the live load nor the roof load act at the same time as the dead load. Next, we'll apply the same idea to load combination number three, which includes live load, wind load, and roof load in addition to the dead load. Applying the same idea to load combination number four, we end up with these eight permutations. And when we apply it to load combination number five, we end up with these two permutations. Next, if we examine all of the permutations next to each other, some of the combinations can obviously be eliminated. For example, if we consider the combinations that include only dead load, then it's obvious that 1.4 times d will govern over 1.2 times d or 0.9 times d. Similarly, if we consider the combinations that include only dead load and roof loading, then it should be obvious that 1.2 times d plus 1.0 times r sub mll, the roof loading at its maximum lifetime level, will govern. If we consider the combinations that include just the dead load and the live load, then it should be obvious that 1.2 times d plus 1.6 times l will control. And when we consider the combinations that include dead load, live load, and roof loading, it should be obvious that 1.2 times d plus 1.6 times l plus 1.0 times r sub apt, the roof loading at its arbitrary point in time loading, will govern. When we consider the load combinations that include dead load and additive wind loads, then it should be obvious that 1.2 times d plus or minus 1.0 times w will govern. To help with the bookkeeping associated with this, I generally use these labels for the remaining unique permutations of the load combinations. Finally, we end up with these 27 permutations of the load combinations that need to be considered for a two-dimensional structure considering directionality of the wind loads and the earthquake loads. As you can see, it doesn't take too long for all of these load combinations to become quite unmanageable. We end up with one permutation of load combination number one, two permutations of load combination number two, four permutations of load combination number three, and so on. When we consider three-dimensional structures with wind and earthquake loads acting in multiple directions, it gets even more complicated. Finally, the ASCE 7 standard includes a load combination that can be used when structures are required to be checked for low probability events such as fire, explosions, vehicular impact, and other similar situations. Where these extraordinary events are required to be considered by the owner or applicable code, strength and stability shall be checked to ensure that the structures are capable of withstanding these effects without suffering disproportionate collapse. Finally, as we wrap up this presentation, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the ASCE 7 standard also includes load combinations for use with allowable stress design. I don't intend to spend any time discussing these, but you should know that they are also included in the ASCE 7 standard.